gotta worry in his hands he got a plan in his hands we don't gotta worry so it's preaching time y'all i say it's preaching time this is what's going to get you through the week. This is what's going to get you fed. And I am always gracious. I am always happy. I'm always excited to brag on her. This uh, young lady who just turned 25. See, you, she grinned me. And I, I, she already grinned me. I didn't even get a chance. Just turned 36. Gorgeous as ever anointed as ever did y'all hear that prayer she prayed like two sundays ago sent us all in listen listen it is a blessing for me to be able to uh, bring up this young lady she is the communication director of wayne county doing it big so you smart anointed and fine that's a triple threat right there but listen, stand to your feet as we gave it up for our God that woke us up this morning, as we gave it up for our pastor and our first lady. Listen, let's not show her of any love. Let's give it up for Minister Tiffany Chanel Jackson. Amen. Thank you, Minister Jackson, for that amazing, gracious introduction. And thank you, Wings of Love, for continuing to open your arms and embrace me and wrap me in your love. Thank you to my pastor, Dr. Albany Jackson Sr. for yet another opportunity to stand before his people and to profess what says the Lord. I thank God for an opportunity to be his vessel, to be his servant. I thank God that he continues to use my voice and to use me to speak to his people. And it's my prayer that lives will be transformed and hearts will be changed, that spirits will be renewed and will be refreshed. My auntie said, how great is our God? How great is our God? That he's the name above all other names, that he is worthy of all our praise. And last Sunday, Minister Jackson and I were watching a service and he was joking with me and he said, the, the preacher said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And Al said, say it. I was glad when they said unto me, go with, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I was like, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You're real aggressive. But then I thought about it. And we come into the house of the Lord and we recite those words. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And then our actions don't reflect our gladness. Gladness is a verb. That means it's an action word. So if you're truly glad to be in the house of the Lord, then your actions have to reflect your words. So if you're going to be truly glad this morning, won't you clap your hands? Won't you lift up your voices? Won't you... Stand to your feet. Won't you let your God truly know how glad you are by allowing your actions to be a reflection of your gladness? Because my heart is overflowing with gladness this morning. I won't be able to sit down on my praise. Amen. You can stand all over the building as we prepare to read the word of God. Stand in reverence of God's word. I'll be reading from the 42nd Psalm. Pastor Jackson says there are no books in Psalms. So the 42nd Psalm, verses 1 and 2, I'll be reading from the NIV. It will be on the screen if you don't have your Bibles. Again, the 42nd Psalm, verses 1 and 2. And it reads... As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? The word of God is blessed and you may be seated in his presence. Father, I thank you. I thank you for another opportunity to stand here before your people 
to profess your word, to preach what you have given to me to share with your people. And Father, I ask that you do what you've done so many times before, that you hide me behind you, that you would crucify every ounce of flesh and that you would sanctify your spirit within me. Let it stand up tall in me. Use me as your vessel now. I pray for every soul under the sound of my voice that this word will fall on good ground. Father, I pray that their ears will be open, sensitive, and attentive so that when you speak, they're able to listen. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that I pray these and all other blessings. And all of God's people said, amen. 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 If I had to assign a topic to our text, it would be a refreshing for your soul. Tell somebody, do you need a refreshing for your soul? So everybody knows Malachi as a basketball player, right? You see his clips on Facebook and Instagram and Pastor Jackson calls him his hoop star. My father used to call him his favorite hooper. He can do his thing out on the basketball court, humbly speaking, and if I must say so, myself. Um, anybody knows I'm a little biased, that I'm completely and utterly obsessed with my child, but facts are facts. But what people don't know is that Malachi used to run cross country for his high school cross country team in the ninth grade. And if you know anything about cross country, cross country is an open air outdoor course. It's a sport that's based on endurance. And just like our journey as Christians, cross country is intended to be more of a marathon than it is to be a sprint. You cannot keep the same pace throughout the entire race but instead, you're expected to adapt to the changing terrain of the course. Yeah. During your time running a cross-country meet, you might have to run on grass, you might have to run on gravel, you might have to run on flat ground, you might have to run through woodlands all at the same time, all during the same race and on the same course. And while running the course, sometimes the tightness of the turns might change. Sometimes there might be more uphills. Sometimes there might be more downhills, which causes the runner to have to switch up their strategy. There are intentional obstacles that are placed along the course for the runner to have to overcome. Participants who run cross country have to run in sunshine. They have to run in, in rain. They have to run through sleet and through snow, through hail and through mud and through everything in between. The cross country course is made for continuous running. The sport of cross country is parallel in many ways to the Christian life. Because from the moment that we accept and confess Christ as the Son of God, as our Lord and as our Savior, we have then unofficially signed up for a life that is constantly in motion. The very foundation of the Christian life is built on action. As Christians, our lives are active even when we don't realize it. Our lives continue to be active even when we would much rather for them to just be still. And we spend so much of our time, so much of our natural lives on the move. We wake up, we get dressed, we get our kids up, we get our kids dressed, we cook breakfast, we make lunches, we do drop-offs, we do pickups, we go to work, we cook dinner, we partake in extracurricular activities, we work out, we come to church, we visit relatives, we visit friends. We are constantly having obligations and our activities are endless. Likewise, our spirits remain just as active as our natural lives. Every day we're running a spiritual race. 
Every day we're fighting a spiritual battle. Every day we're juggling burdens. These active lifestyles have been predestined and pre-assigned to us as Christians. These active lifestyles come with a command to fight the good fight. These active lifestyles come with a command to run the race with perseverance. In reality, just because we're able to persevere through doesn't mean that we're always leading the race. Just because we're commanded to persevere through doesn't mean that we're going to always win the battle. It doesn't mean that every day will be a good day. Some days are going to get the best of us. Some days we'll be forced to switch up our strategy to be able to overcome the obstacles that are intentionally placed on the course before us. But the key is that we never stop running. One day you might feel like you're fighting an uphill battle. Your money gets tight. Your mortgage or your rent is due. The bills, they keep rolling in. Your car breaks down. Your kids, they need clothes. Your refrigerator might get empty. And if you're honest, you start to get a little nervous and a little stressed out. And your anxiety begins to rise. And you might even start to lose some sleep. But you never stop running. Other days, you might feel like everything is spiraling downhill. A loved one dies. You get an unexpected report from the doctor. Your children start acting up. You're fed up and you feel like you've reached your wit's end. But you never stop pressing forward. You never stop fighting. You never stop running the race. Your race is continuous and I know that I'm not by myself. There has to be somebody in here who can relate to these uphill and downhill battles to constantly having to overcome these obstacles. Somebody in here has felt like they just couldn't get a break. Somebody in here has felt like you're just always bringing up the rear. Like you just can't keep up. You feeling like a hamster that's spinning on a wheel that's going nowhere fast. Does it ever seem like you just, whew, you just can't catch your breath? No matter how hard you try, you just find yourself panting and unable to catch your breath. My grandmama said if it ain't one thing, then it's another. And I think by now, all of us understand that as Christians, we were never created to just sit. Never created to just passively and motionlessly go through life. But what happens when we're constantly on the move? What happens when we're constantly fighting? Constantly pressing, constantly changing, when we never stop running? What happens when you're forced to face ongoing trials and tribulations, when there are countless afflictions that come your way? What happens when you're struggling with your endurance while running this Christian race. What happens is you eventually, you get tired. Eventually, your souls become weary and they start longing for something more. Eventually, we start to desperately desire reprieve and a refreshing. And it doesn't help that the enemy is always up to something. It doesn't help that the enemy is always on the prowl looking for someone to devour. Because you know that the enemy is both crafty and consistent. The enemy is consistently and constantly aggravating us. 
consistently and constantly pouncing at us, consistently and constantly chasing us as believers. The enemy is constantly trying to create a distraction that causes us to slip while we're on our journey. The enemy doesn't want us to be able to catch our breath. It's his goal to keep us panting, to keep our souls weary, and to keep us tired. At the end of every one of Malachi's cross-country races, whenever he would cross the finish line, he'd be sweaty, he'd be exhausted, and he'd be working extra hard to try to catch his breath. And he would be searching high and low for something that could replenish him. And this is how our souls feel after fighting battle after battle, after overcoming test after test, after working hard to make sure that we're not conforming to the ways of this world, after taking up our cross and working to follow Jesus and trying to live right, our souls are longing for a refreshing. And see, with this text, it's a common misconception that a deer begins to pant because of thirst. But the reality is, a deer begins to pant because of its need for rest. After being chased by an enemy, after miles and miles of running, the deer seeks out water as a resting place. It seeks out water as a place to find refuge from an enemy. It seeks out water as a place to wash off to cool down and to find protection from the predator that's been chasing it. The deer pants for streams of water as a place to refuel and recharge. So when the psalmist writes, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. It's because the psalmist understands what it means for his soul to be weary. The psalmist understands what it's like for your soul to be longing. The psalmist understands what it's like to be yearning and desperately in need for a refreshing for your soul. And it's just like a broken bone. Whenever you break a bone, it needs rest and it needs rehabilitation. So just like a broken bone needs rest and rehabilitation, so does a broken, overworked, weary soul need rejuvenation. So does it need refueling. So does it need restoring. So does it desperately need a refreshing. It's absolutely normal for us to get tired when running the Christian race. It's absolutely normal for us to get tired when fighting the good fight. I mean, even Jesus needed time to rest. Even Jesus needed time to refuel. Even Jesus needed time to be restored. So the issue is not the need for rest. The issue is not that you become tired. The issue comes in when you're tired, but you don't recharge. The issue comes when your soul is panting and you neglect it. The issue comes when you don't connect to a repowering source. So if your soul is panting for God, if your soul is constantly longing for refuge, yeah. if your soul is constantly searching for re-energizing, yeah. if you seem like you're just constantly walking around in need of just, just something else, 
you just can't put your finger on it, but it's something that's missing. It, it, it's something that's lacking. It's, it's something that I'm needing. Yeah. Then it's because you haven't taken time to refuel. You're trying to navigate through this journey on E. You're walking around with an empty tank. Your soul is going to give you signs. Your soul will always give you a sign that it is panting and in need of a refreshing. And ignoring these signs can be detrimental to your life. Ignoring these signs can cause you to become both physically and spiritually stagnant. So I'm going to leave you with six signs to recognize that your soul is in need of a refreshing. Number one, you're discouraged and distracted. You've heard God's promises. You've read God's promises. But you're having a real hard time receiving those promises. You having a real hard time believing those promises. When the children of Israel were free from captivity in Egypt and from under Pharaoh, and they were in the wilderness, they had a promised land waiting for them. But when their souls got weary, they started to lack faith. They became discouraged and distracted, and they missed out on the promise that God had for them because their souls were weary, and it jaded their vision. Number two, praying becomes a task. Whenever we're experiencing soul fatigue, it becomes difficult for us to pray. Because when we're absent from God, it's hard for us to speak to God. But it's in these moments that we have to become more and more reliant on the Holy Spirit to speak to God on our behalf. Prayer is a vital part. You just heard my husband play the video. Prayer is a vital part hearts in finding rest for our souls because it's prayer that helps us solidify our connection with our father number three you're settling and disobedient again you know what God promised you know that he promised exceedingly you know that he promised abundantly you know he promised above. He, you know he said he would give you more than what you could ask, than what you could think. You've heard his voice speaking to you. You've heard him give you direction. You felt the pull. You felt the call. But instead, you settle. You settle for status quo because status quo is the place that's comfortable and requires minimal efforts. When your souls are tired, you become depleted of faith. And when you're tired, coupled with depleted of faith, then you easily settle for what's familiar. You easily settle for what is safe. When you're tired and lacking faith, it's easy for you to seek instant gratification. It's easy for you to just want to take the easy way out. It's easy for you to just choose other places and put other things before God. It's easy for you to just become disobedient to his word. It's easy for you to become counterparts with sin because your soul is tired, exhausted. So you settle and you become disobedient. Number four, you're dissatisfied. Don't you know that contentment comes from God? So when we're separate 
from God. When our souls are panting and left unreplenished, we walk around dissatisfied, unable to find contentment. In Philippians chapter 4, the writer says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. But if you're not operating in him, there is no strength. If you're not operating in him, there is no contentment. It's the strength that we gain from the presence of God that breathes contentment and overshadows any difficulties that we may be uh, experiencing in our lives. It's this contentment that brings us reassurance that all things work together for the good of them who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Number five, you're isolated. Isolation is our first response when we get tired. I don't want to go nowhere. I don't want to see nobody. I don't want to do nothing. I don't want nobody to come over. Uh-uh, find somebody else to do it. So when your soul is tired, your first response is to isolate. Number six, you lack self-control. Self-discipline is God granted. God gave us the spirit of self-discipline. But if we're not connected, if we're not in constant conversation, if we're not in communion with God, then our self-control begins to lack. We start doing any and everything, going any and everywhere, hooking up with any and everybody, saying whatever we want to say, doing whatever we want to do with whoever we want to do it with. You out of control. Everybody's soul at one point or another, becomes weary. But when your soul becomes weary, it's important that you immediately begin to seek God for a refresher. Just because you might feel like you're able to endure the weariness of this season, that does not make it a healthy response. Don't you know that even a boxer that's winning a fight needs rest? Have you all ever watched a professional boxing match? Come here. You right there looking kind of cute. Right? Okay. Right? So y'all watch a professional boxing match. You going to act like you fighting. Don't touch me. Because I'm winning. Right? So I'm winning the race. I'm fighting. Act like you're going to fall. I'm winning, y'all, okay? I don't know if I'm MMA in a fight or boxing, but anyway. So I'm winning. The bell rings. I'm winning. Okay, you can go sit back down. I'm winning, but I'm tired. So I got to go back to my corner, sit down, Take me a drink of water, shake it off, wipe the sweat from my brow, and get refreshed. I got to hear from my trainer what the new strategy is for me to go out the next round and keep winning my fight. So if a boxer needs refreshing, Surely our souls need refreshing when we're fighting this good fight of, of faith. Surely our soul need refreshing when we're trying to run this Christian race. 
God never commanded us to run this race alone. This was never supposed to be an independent race. I keep making all these comparisons to cross country, but in cross country, the teams often run in packs. And the reason why the teams run in packs is because they're supposed to encourage one another. When one of your runners gets tired, your pack is supposed to be there to encourage you not to quit, to encourage you not to give up, to encourage you not to throw in the tile. So let me tell you, you better find somebody who can encourage you along this journey. You better find you somebody who can pray when you can't pray for yourself. You better find somebody who can witness to you when your soul's too tired. You better find somebody who can carry you into the presence of God in your weary season. You better find somebody who will be committed to helping you carry your burdens to the Father when they seem too heavy for you to bear by yourself. And when all else fails, if you can't find nobody, you better let the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be your pack. You, you better learn how to let the Lord fight your battles. You better learn how to let the Holy Spirit interpret your moans and your groans and your prayers when you all you can do is utter. When you can't find the words to say, you better learn how to depend on the gift of the Holy Ghost. You better learn to depend on Jesus to be your strength when you get weary and when you get tired. There's only one way that you're going to truly find rest for a panting soul. You better learn how to offload those burdens to God. Once you become his servant, you have a responsibility to learn from him. It's through his this teacher-pupil relationship that we learn how to find true rest for our weary souls. But how can we learn if we never open up our Bibles? How can we learn if we refuse to tune in to Facebook Live on Sunday mornings? How can we learn if we're not seeking wisdom? He said, if any man lack wisdom, let him... Uncle said... I want you to finish. If any man lack wisdom, let him. Thank you, Pastor Jackson. Pastor Jones wasn't ready. <laughs> we can't learn if we never make the sacrifice to make our way to wings of love on Sunday morning. The reality is we're exhausting ourselves by a lack of effort. We're not putting in any effort to try to find a refreshing for our souls, we're willing, willingly walking around empty. It's reading, hearing, meditating on, and practicing God's word that calms and restores a panting soul. It's through his word that we learn to find comfort in chaos and calm in the midst of confusion. Any other attempt to find rest will only provide temporary solutions. So now that I've told you the signs of a weary soul, it's important that you be honest with yourselves. It's important that whenever you begin to experience any of these signs, that instead of running from them, you run to the proper place to get replenished because you can only last so long running on empty before you're no longer a threat to the enemy or an asset to the kingdom I can't leave here without pointing out one of the biggest differences between us as children of God and deers who pant for water See, the deer instinctively runs and hides to keep themselves safe from the enemies. But we as children of God, we weren't created to run and hide. We were created to face our enemies head on. 
we were created to learn how to resi resist the devil and cause him to flee, not the other way around. Pastor Jackson just told us last week, we don't got no armor on our backs because you shouldn't be turned around running from your enemy. This resistance is made possible because we've been equipped with armor that helps us to excel in our spiritual warfare. It ensures us that we don't lose our footing in the midst of the enemy's schemes. The ultimate reality is we don't have to run and hide from the enemy because Jesus already defeated him on Calvary. But if you're not tapped in with God, then you're going to be left with missing pieces and holes in your armor. If you aren't relying on the Holy Spirit, how easily it will be to forget the power that's been granted to us through Jesus when he stood on resurrection ground. If we don't seek a refreshing from the true and living God, our souls will quickly be depleted and we'll find ourselves just like those deers. We'll find ourselves hiding and concealing ourselves from the enemy, ill-prepared, running and panting for our lives. Won't you tell somebody, don't you know too much panting makes you thirsty? If you pant too long, you're going to end up thirsty. And did you know that by the time your body experienced thirst, it's already dehydrated? Thirst is a symptom of dehydration. So by the time we make it to verse 2 in our text, we have already have a bit of a situation on our hands. By the time we make it to verse 2, we've moved beyond just being tired and needing rest to being full on spiritually dehydrated. Dehydration leaves us confused, anxious, and cranky. Physical dehydration affects our brain's cognitive ability and affects our hearts, which are both spiritual areas that are also affected when our souls are tired. Spiritual tiredness and weariness also affects the brain and heart's ability to properly function. And because of the similarity in symptoms, it can be easy to confuse the cause of our need for rest. It's easy to confuse spiritual weariness with physical weariness and spiritual dehydration with physical dehydration. So we start to think, I'll be okay if I can just rest my eyes for a little while. Maybe all I need is just a good night's rest, just to take a little nap after work, and then I'll be okay. But a telltale sign of what type of weariness you're experiencing is when physical rest just can't cure what's ailing you. Soul weariness can't be cured through earthly measures. Even a week-long island vacation won't be a sufficient remedy when your soul is tired and needs refreshing. And likewise, spiritual dehydration can't be remedied by drinking from worldly cups. Chances are, by the time your souls reach dehydration, you've already ignored the panting to the point of overexertion and you've tried to calm it with the things of this world. And you never once took a sip from the well that never runs dry. Wow. The psalmist writes that my soul thirst, not just for God, but for the living God. And this is an important part because when your soul is thirsty, a stand-in just won't do. An idol won't quench that thirst. A Gatorade, nightcap, or even an IV at the hospital won't be sufficient enough to cure you. The only thing sufficient enough to extinguish the thirst of your soul is the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is given to us as a gift, as an invaluable resource to guide us along our journey. The Word is here because it is what keeps us connected to the Father. Yeah. 
And we should be partaking in the word daily as a preventative measure for spiritual dehydration. Because it's the word that we learn that if an enemy is on our trail, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. It's in the word that we learn that if our souls are panting, we have the ability to come unto him if we're weary and burdened and he'll give us rest. It's in the word that we're reminded that when we're tempted to just run and hide, that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It's in the word where we find strength and power and weakness. It's in the word that we learn to wait on the Lord for renewed strength. For wings like eagles, for a time when we can run and not be weary, and a time where we can walk and not faint. It's in the word that we're reminded that only if we knew enough, if only we had enough sense just to ask him for a drink when we get thirsty, that he'll give us living water. That he'll give us the type of water that will cause us to never thirst again. So if your soul gets thirsty, it's because you haven't been tapped into the spring of water welling up on the inside of you. If your soul is thirsty, it's because you're not nurturing the rivers of living water that are already flowing on the inside of you. When we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, we received rivers of living water that flow in our innermost being so that we never have to live in a state of drought. We have been supplied with a never-ending, all-encompassing, self-sufficient source that's able to meet every single one of our needs simultaneously. So whatever our hearts desire, whatever we stand in the need of, we already have an internal, an internal, eternal source living on the inside of us. So if we're thirsting for joy, we've already got that. If we're thirsty for peace, we've already got that. If it's healing that we stand in the need of, we've already got that. If your heart is broken and needs to be mended, you've already got that. If it's freedom from sin that you're seeking, you've already got that. If it's being broken and set free from the stronghold of addiction, you've already got that. If you're looking desperately for comfort in your grief, you've already got that. So I'm going to leave you with this point. If you remember... At the beginning of this message, I told you that the foundation of the Christian life is built on action. Well, how befitting is it that God would give us a spring of living water that we have planted down inside our souls? It's a gift that will well up and fill our spirits with satisfaction. So this is an everlasting internal activity that continues to occur until the day of Jesus' return. So while all the non-believers are seeking fulfillment and satisfaction from these external sources, we walk around daily filled with everything that we need. We carry with us each day all of our essentials, anything that our souls desire our souls already possess. The spring is how we remain satisfied. The spring is how we stay tapped in to the spirit of self-discipline. The spring is what brings back to our remembrance the word of God so that when we're tempted with being discouraged, when we're tempted with getting distracted, when we're tempted to be disobedient, we have this spring and the word of God hidden in our hearts and we're reminded that his grace is sufficient for us. The best way for us to beat dehydration is to drink before we get thirsty. Drinking daily from God's cup keeps us refreshed and reminded 
of his sacrifice and of our salvation. So allow me to ask you this one question. Is your soul panting? Have you been fighting spiritual battles with earthly forces? Has your soul been so tired that nothing seems to get the job done? Have you gone on a vacation, taken time off work, scheduled a spa day, tried to sage your whole house, and won't nothing cure it? Well, I've got the solution. The only solution is to seek refuge, refueling, and replenishing in the word of God and allow the word of God, the spirit of God, and the well of living water to spring up on the inside of you and replenish your soul. So if you don't take anything else away from this message, I want you to remember this. Never stop running. You've been equipped with everything you need to run the race. You've been equipped with everything you need to fight the fight. And when you get tired, make sure you seek refuge. Seek refuge in the living God, in his living water, and in his word. And when you get thirsty, make sure you refuel with the Father. God bless you.